let us look at several operations on convex sets so first is intersection so if two sets s1 and s2 are convex then it follows that intersection of s1 and s2 is also convex this is not hard to see pictorially you can imagine that if these are the two sets it can be seen that their intersection is also convex so if these two sets are convex then their intersection is also convex so let's say that there are two points x1 which belongs to so x1 belongs to s1 intersection s2 and likewise x2 belongs to s1 intersection s2 now because x1 belongs to s1 intersection x, s2 it therefore also belongs to s1 and s2 both right so this implies that x1 belongs to s1 and likewise x1 belongs to s2 likewise the second statement implies that x2 also belongs to s1 and x2 belongs to s2 now let us use the fact that s1 and s2 are both convex so these imply that theta times x1 plus 1 minus theta times x2 belongs to s1 right this is just the definition of convexity likewise this one will imply that theta times x1 plus 1 minus theta times x2 belongs to s2 so this is again the definition of convexity for s1 and s2 now combining these two it can be seen that theta times x1 plus 1 minus theta times x2 belongs to s1 intersection s2 because this point belongs to both s1 and s2 hence we can conclude from here that s1 intersection s2 is convex although this proof is uh, done for two sets it actually holds for arbitrary number of sets in fact it also holds for infinite number of sets so this idea that intersection of convex sets is convex also holds for infinite number of sets let's take an example where we are taking an intersection of infinite number of sets so let me define a set c of u as so this set is a function of a vector u so depending on u the set may be different now this set is given as the set of all matrices which are symmetric such that u transpose x u is greater than equal to 0 right so for a given u this set is specified so this set depends on what u is specified to us if u is a certain vector then this set will be according to that for a given u what kind of set is cu there are two kinds of uh, equations here the first is x belong to sn which is basically a intersection of hyperplanes if you remember so these are all hyperplanes and the second one is u transpose x u is greater than or equal to 0 so what kind of constraint is this this is nothing but half space constraint so this is a half space remember that we are looking only at the entries of x to decide what kind of constraint is this we don't care about u this expression is quadratic in u but u is already given to us so we don't care about u we are only saying that entries of x appear linearly on the left hand side and then there is a greater than equal to sign so therefore this is a half space so these are hyperplanes these are half spaces together this set is a polyhedron it's an intersection of hyperplanes and half spaces so therefore for a given u this is a polyhedron so cu is a polyhedron for a given u 
Now let us consider the set C equal to intersection of U in Rn of Cu. So now we are considering intersection of infinite number of such sets basically indexed by U and U is any real vector in Rn. Right. So what is this set? You can see that this set consists of all matrices which are symmetric such that they satisfy u transpose x u greater than equal to 0 for all u in R n. Right. So this set is the set of all matrices that satisfy u transpose x u greater than equal to 0 for all u in R n. And therefore what kind of set is this? This is the positive semi-definite cone. So we have already seen that this is a positive semi-definite cone. It is also called Sn plus and we have we also know that it is actually convex. Right. So this is an example where we took an intersection of several polyhedrons. Polyhedrons are convex because they are intersections of hyperplanes and half spaces which are also convex. We took intersection of several polyhedrons and obtain a convex set. In fact, we took an intersection of infinite number of polyhedrons. You can imagine a simpler example where you form a circle by taking intersection of several half spaces of this form. Right. So you can actually get the inside of a circle by taking intersection of several half spaces of this form. So each half space is something like this. So if you continue to do this, you will actually end up with this part completely filled. So that would be the inside of a circle and that is an intersection of several half spaces. So in general, a norm ball is the intersection of half spaces. But this is an infinite in intersection. Another type of operation that we will now see is the affine transformation. So you might have heard of the term linear transformation. The affine transformation is related. So an affine transformation is basically an operation. So Ax is given by Ax plus B. Here X is a vector in Rn and uh, I could allow A to be in R m cross n. So in that case, the affine transformation maps or goes from Rn to Rn. In other words, it takes an input in Rn, which would be x. It takes an input in Rn and outputs Ax plus B, which is a vector in Rm. So here B is in Rm. So this is an affine transformation or this is an example of an affine transformation from Rn to Rm. So how do I apply affine transformation on a set? So let's say that C is a subset of Rn. C is a set which lies in Rn. Then an affine transformation of C is given by, let's call this set as B and it is given by points of the form Ax where x belongs to C. So essentially here what we are doing is we are taking every point in C and applying the affine transformation to it. So you take every point in C and transform it using this Ax plus B. Right. So this is also called the image of C under this affine transformation under Ax plus B. So this is the image of C under Ax plus B. And likewise, it is also possible to define the inverse image. So the inverse image of B is the set of all X in Rn such that Ax, the transformed function belongs to C. Sorry, belongs to B. So this is called the inverse image of B 
under ax plus b so this is the inverse image of b under the same affine transformation right so the result is that if c is convex then its affine transformation a of c is also convex likewise if b is convex then its inverse affine transformation or the inverse image is also convex so the affine transformation and inverse transformation preserves convexity of a set so whenever you have a set you transform it in an affine manner then it stays convex we have already actually seen an example of such a transformation so let's look at some more examples so first very simple example is the scaling so let's say that let's define the affine transformation of the form alpha times x for all x in c right so this corresponds to a equal to alpha times identity in ax plus b and b equal to 0 so this is the scaling you can easily imagine that scaling would preserve convexity because you are just simply scaling the set down or up right even here alpha is allowed to be negative in that case the sets get set gets reflected uh, through the origin another similar and very intuitive one is the translation so the translation uh, is given by points of the form x plus x naught where x belongs to c so we have basically added x naught to all the points in c then we also have a projection so there are different kinds of projection let's take a simple example of the projection which is given by p times x where x belongs to c and p is of the form so it is an identity matrix of size k cross k and then rest are zero right so x is in rn and p is in k p is a k cross n matrix so first k cross k are identity and the last k cross n minus k terms are all zero so this matrix looks like this so what is this uh, projection matrix doing it is basically picking the first k components of x and then keeping them so it's basically ignoring or discarding the last n minus k components of x so this is a kind of projection and because this is a affine transformation it remains convex so in other words you can take a set in higher dimension remove some of its component and still the remaining set in a lower dimension would remain convex then let us look at a slightly more complicated example the example is that whenever you have a sphere or let's call it spheroid spheroid is the term in n dimension then its affine transformation yields a ellipsoid right so the spheroid is formed using a norm ball and the ellipsoid is formed by using a transformation that we have already seen so what is the transformation that takes a norm ball to an ellipsoid so let's say that c is equal to u such that norm of u is less than equal to 1 so this is the unit norm ball and its affine transformation so the affine transformation given by square root p u plus x naught such that norm of u is less than equal to 1 is the ellipsoid so this is the ellipsoid right so you can see that ellipsoid is a affine transformation of c which is a unit norm ball so here if you if you write it as ax plus b then the transformation entails multiplying with the matrix square root p and then translating as x naught translating by x naught before concluding let us look at uh, uh, the idea of 
product of sets so the product set is given by so if there are two sets c1 and c2 their product is given by this set so x1 x2 such that x1 belongs to c1 and x2 belongs to c2 so this is the product of two sets and uh, the product of two convex sets is also convex so this is also convex whenever c1 c2 are convex if two sets are of compatible size then we can define the minkowski sum as follows so minkowski sum of two sets c1 and c2 is defined as all points of the form x1 plus x2 such that x1 belongs to c1 and x2 belongs to c2 so here it is necessary that x1 x2 are of compatible size so that they can be added with each other you can see that if a set c1 and c2 are convex then their minkowski sum is also convex because this is essentially an affine transformation of the product set so the minkowski sum is an affine transformation of the product set